our first seminar of the fall semester 2013-2014. If you don't know me, I'm Terry Stratton. I'm Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild, and I plan all of these seminars for the Guild. As always, if you have any um, requests or questions, there are people you're dying to see, please feel free to email me. Uh, you can find my email address on the website, or I'm at tstratton at dramatistguild.com. Uh, let me remind you to uh, put your phones on silent. We'll, we'll try leaving them on. If you want to uh, tweet or do anything like that during the session today, feel free to do so. We are uh, live streaming, so hello everybody on the internet. Uh, if you have a question later on, please make sure you ask it loud enough so that our uh, online audience can hear it. That way, if they have the same question, they know not to ask it also. Okay? Without further ado, I'm very excited to have with us Ann Morgan from the O'Neill Center. And she is going to walk you through the application process, the do's and don'ts, and answer any questions you might have about that. Okay. Welcome to Ann. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the Dramatist Guild. It's a real thrill to be here uh, talking to you and to everyone on the internet as well. Uh, my name is Anne Morgan. I'm the literary manager uh, at The O'Neill. Uh, and the bulk of my work there uh, is really uh, overseeing the submission and selection processes uh, for the National Playwrights Conference and the National Music Theater Conference. Um, a little general background about the O'Neill before I dive into those two conferences. Uh, the O'Neill is located uh, in Waterford, Connecticut, right on the uh, Long Island Sound. Um, and we were founded just about 50 years ago. Uh, 2014 is our 50th anniversary. Uh, the National Playwrights Conference was our founding conference, uh, but since then we've developed a number of different programs, all to discover and develop and nurture new work and new artists for the stage. So we have the Playwrights Conference, which I'm going to talk about in depth, uh, and the National Music Theater Conference uh, as well. We also have the National Puppetry Conference, uh, which is developing new works of puppet theater. It's about a little over 20 years old, and it was uh, founded by the Henson family, among others. Uh, we have the Cabaret and Performance Conference, uh, which is developing new works of uh, cabaret, intimate performance, usually with music, uh, with the audience more engaged in the action. Uh, we have the National Critics Conference, uh, which is one of our oldest programs, uh, training theatrical journalists uh, and really getting them inside the rehearsal room so they know uh, what it is that happens when we, when we make plays. Uh, we have the National Theater Institute, which is our undergraduate tr uh, study away training program. Uh, students come from all over the country to study nothing but theater very intensively for a semester. Uh, and then we also own and operate as a museum the house where Eugene O'Neill, our namesake, grew up. Um, but the National Playwrights Conference, our founding conference, uh, I thought what I would do is give a little bit of background on what the conference is and then sort of walk through the application process, how one gets to the conference, uh, and then do the same thing uh, for the Music Theater Conference, what it is, and then the application process, uh, and then sort of some questions I get frequently. Uh, the National Playwrights Conference takes place during the month of July. Um, we develop anywhere from six to eight plays over that time. Uh, we are doing two plays a week uh, that are slightly staggered. Um, but the writers are in residency for the entire time, so they may do their week of development right at the top of the month of July and just be in residence writing and watching the other works for the rest of the month, or they may be writing solitaire uh, by themselves uh, for much of the month and then heading into the rehearsal later. Uh, so it's staggered, but the writers are there for the entire time. Uh, each play gets about a four and a half day long rehearsal process. One of the things uh, that makes uh, this rehearsal process really unique is that it begins with something called the dream design process. We have a team of resident designers at the O'Neill, which is a little bit unusual for a developmental organization. We're not going to build full sets. We're not going to build full costumes. But what this conversation is, it's between the designers and the writer. Uh, the director and dramaturg are present, but they're asked to be silent. Um, which can sometimes be a challenge. And the designers have a conversation with the writer about 
if money were not an object, if the laws of physics were not an object, what would the sensory world of this play be? Really sort of exploring it inside and out. Um, and then the designers go away and they do some research and they do some renderings uh, and the writer gets to take all of that with them when they leave the O'Neill. So that's what starts our process. Um, and then four days of rehearsal, table work, some staging if the writers need it or just all around the table if that's what the writer needs. Uh, we try to be flexible in our process uh, with what the writer feels will help them the most. Um, and at the end of that uh, period of time, there are two public staged readings. Uh, after the first staged reading, the director, writer, and dramaturg will go away, talk about how it all went. There are two hours of rehearsal the following day to put in any changes. I've seen some processes make no changes during that two hour uh, rehearsal period and some totally change the play. Uh, and then a second public reading. Um, we bring in a full team, director, actors, dramaturgs. Uh, we really try to get the best of the best people who are, get really excited about uh, new plays. Um, and then the rest, of the, the rest of the time, once the writer is finished with that four and a half day uh, process, like I said, they're in residence uh, on our beautiful uh, bucolic campus. They can keep writing the play that they were developing. They can write a whole nother play. They can go hang out on the beach. Uh, they can use the literary staff to help them research for their next project. Um, it's really sort of time for them as writers to do whatever it is uh, they need. Uh, and we really try to support that. Uh, and then at the end of the very end of the whole conference, uh, each writer sits down individually uh, with our artistic director, Wendy Goldberg, to talk about what might happen for the play next. Uh, where the writer might want the play to find a home, who the writer knows, who the writer's agent, if they have one, knows if they don't have an agent, would they like one, and how uh, can we set up those conversations in a way that's helpful to them. If Wendy knows directors or artistic directors, is that the best channel to get the work out? Uh, so we do try to think very consciously uh, what, uh, where the work is going next. Um, that is uh, NPC in a very brief nutshell. How do we get there? That's July. It starts now. Uh, we are now accepting applications for the 2014 conference um, through October 25th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. So you folks here in New York oh. can actually stay up until 3 in the morning if you want. Um, some people do. Uh, but you have until October 25th. Um, and what happens to your application? You can apply online or with a hard copy. Uh, there's a $35 application fee that supports uh, the open submission process. We don't sample we for the National Players Conference. We want your full script. Uh, and we guarantee that it will be read uh, all the way through at least once. Uh, it is a blind reading process, uh, which means that when you give us your full script, we ask that your name isn't on it. Uh, this is something I feel really strongly about. It means that our readers are judging your script by itself without any, I've heard of this writer, I haven't <laughs> heard of this writer. Um, they're just uh, reading it blind. Um, the application also asks for a little bit of background about you, your bio, uh, things like that that uh, is internal to my office to help us process your application. Um, and then a statement of objectives, which does go uh, with your script, uh, and that stays both within my office and goes out to our readers. We anticipate getting between 900 and 1,100 scripts. Um, 20 to 25 percent of those will advance to the semifinal round, uh, where they are then read again. Um, then they're read uh, if they score well in the semifinal round. They're read uh, again by my team, and then uh, about 20 percent of the semifinalists, uh, which is about 40 to 50 scripts total, uh, will advance to our finalist round. Um, and from that, uh, we will select our summer selections. Um, all applicants are notified in February about their status, either way. Um, and we make final selections 
in April. One question I get asked a lot is who is reading my script? Um, our first round of readers are people that are connected to the O'Neill family. Uh, they are actors, directors, students, former interns, people who have seen the O'Neill's process in action uh, and understand what it is that we do. Um, we have over 100 readers and I believe in them so much. I love them because they volunteer their time. Um, and what I do is uh, with people, with readers that are new to us, if I can, I assign a second reader to make sure that those, there's no way a script is going to fall through the crack. Um, and I read every single reader report that comes in just to double check uh, to make sure that bec because readers and scripts are randomly assigned, if I see a report that says this plays politics really offended me, I know, okay, that reader is responding to the content and not the quality of the writing, and then I maybe assign it to a different reader uh, as well to make sure that we're really uh, trying to be as fair as possible in a process that has a lot in it. Um, and then our semi-finalists get read by members of our artistic council. Our artistic council is a much smaller pool. Uh, these are people who make their bread and butter working on new plays. Directors, artistic directors, literary managers from around the country, um, people who's, uh, who are really sort of at the top of this field. Um, and then if they value something highly, then it comes through my office and then goes, like I said, uh, to Wendy and she makes the final decisions. The MPC application process in a nutshell. Concurrently with the Playwrights Conference every summer uh, is the National Music Theater Conference, uh, which is just about 35 years old. Um, it f was founded with the same principles uh, as the Playwrights Conference to give writers uh, an opportunity to hear their words, hear their music in this case, uh, in front of an audience, pull it apart, put it back together, see what works, take chances. You know, there are no critics. There's the Training Institute, but that's uh, kept very closed. Um, but there's, there's no, no very low stakes. So we try to keep it really focused on uh, the writers. Um, so that starts in mid-June and goes through mid-July. We'll do uh, two to four uh, pieces uh, summer. Um, and we really, it's the National Music Theater Conference rather than the National Music Musical Conference, which is a slight distinction. Um, but we do opera and we do um, sort of non-traditional music theater pieces. Uh, so we try to keep that open. Um, those pieces get two weeks of rehearsal because it takes a little bit more time uh, to learn the music. Um, and if you're writing a whole new song, that takes a little bit more time. Uh, so it's two weeks of rehearsal, uh, and they get four public stage readings, two during the first week, two during the second week. Um, again, a profession whole professional team brought in. Uh, they also have mentors brought in um, after who see the show cold and then respond privately uh, with the creative team. Um, but again, very much the same, same principles. Um, focused on them and what they need for the piece. Uh, music theater applications uh, open October 28th and go through November 25th. Uh, so if you want your deadlines, it's October 25th for playwrights, November 25th for music theater. We try to keep it simple that way. Uh, this is the very first year we will, we will be doing online applications for the music theater conference. I'm very excited about this and hope hope it all works out, um, but we know it can be a burden to put those packages together with multiple copies of the scripts and multiple copies of the CDs. So uh, we're trying to move things online there. You can also send in a hard copy if you prefer. Um, that application process, a little bit different. It's a 30-page sample uh, with six demo tracks that we're looking for. Uh, again, a lot of the same basic info about the applicant, uh, statement of objectives, what you want to accomplish at the conference, um, and a history of the work's development. The next step for this application process, because we only asked for the first 30 pages at the start, is we would then request uh, the full script uh, in January is the time frame there. Um, and final decisions are made in April. Both conferences make their selections around the same time in April. Um, 
we anticipate uh, getting between 150 and 175 applications for that conference. Um, and that's that in a nutshell. Um, some other questions I get quite a lot. I think the most common question I get is what should I put in my statement of objectives? It's a tough one, I know. A um, Couple things I always say about this. Um, I assume when I, when I, this is me personally, uh, when I encounter a project uh, that you don't want the O'Neill to be the end of your work's journey. Uh, so a statement of objectives that says, I think my play is great and I want it to go to Broadway. I assume, I assume that you do want your play to go on to a long and happy life and I hope it does as well. Uh, but we're looking for a little bit more meat than that. Um, I think of it this way. If a writer friend of mine invited me to see a reading of their work, I would see a reading, we'd go out for a drink after, coffee the next day, and they would say, I thought the reading went like this, and here are the things I want to work on moving forward. Think of it like that conversation. It's written, I know, it's not as fun as going out for a drink or coffee, um, but it's really your chance to talk to the person who's just encountered your play. Um, they have read it, so you don't need to worry about spoilers or anything like that. Um, tell us if it's had a reading already and what's worked and what you want to continue to explore. Um, tell us what excites you about the play or what got you started in the first place. Um, but I really, I want to know what your perspective of the work is and where where on your journey you feel like you are. Um, and we ask that it's about a page, and I've seen, I've seen these take a number of different forms. Sometimes it's one lengthy block of text all sort of unpacking this one component of the play. Sometimes it's a list. Uh, sometimes it's very, very, very specific. Sometimes it's an arc or a character that wants to be explored. It, it, can, it varies depending on the work, obviously. Um, but help me understand where you're at with the play, I think, is the best advice I have uh, for that element. Um, another question I get a lot is, will I get a response to the play? After it's made it through the selection process, um, and if we reject the work, will you get a response? And the answer is no, I'm afraid not. Um, and the reason for that is we don't want to, because we have so many works submitted, and that thrills me, that there is so much, so many pieces of theater being written, um, we are going to turn away good work. And I know that, and it breaks my heart all the time. Um, but we don't want to give you a response to, uh, to a play that we haven't selected. Um, and have to uh, encourage you to make changes to the script, um, changes that might alienate another theater company that might like the play just as it is. Uh, so that, that's sort of our philosophy um, behind, um, behind why we don't give responses. That is sort of the quick and dirty of the O'Neill and its application uh, processes. Any questions out the gate? Yes. You didn't say how many, <coughs> the how many of the finalists are in the both of those programs. Sure. Uh, the finalists we had we start with around 50 finalists for the Playwrights Conference, and of 40 to 50, and of that group, uh, five to seven are selected uh, for the summer. The music theater conference is a little more rolling, so the number is a little iffy. Uh, I would say it's less than 20 uh, finalists for the music theater conference. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I know it's a trick. It's probably maybe an impossible thing to answer <laughs> because it's it's so subjective, mm -hmm. um, and it probably is fluid. It probably changes depending upon what script matches up with what statement of objectives. But the you said everybody asks about this, and that is what I wanted to ask you yes. about. Okay. How would you, it, if you could quantify it at all, uh -huh. how, how much weight would you say you give to the script versus the statement of objectives, and how much w of one influences the other? Now, obviously, you want a great script, right. but if it's a, a fantastic script, but somebody, like I wonder, I guess when I was listening to you, I was wondering 
it sounds like maybe you want plays that are already in a more advanced stage because if you've just got like a first draft but you think it's got brilliant potential, mm -hmm. you may not be able to recognize without having yet heard it in a reading what's working and what's not working and that's specifically why you want to apply to the O'Neill sure. to help me with this. I don't know what part of this is working and what's not working but that's probably too vague. So what, what does that... Well, and that's it's a great question, and we we accept work in all stages uh, of development. We've had works come to us that have never been read aloud, and I think that's certainly a valid thing uh, to say. To say, I've written this, but I've never heard these voices aloud. Do these characters ring true when given voice by actors? Those are all really valid things to say. And if you don't know, if you don't know what questions come after that, then then tell us why you're excited about it. Um, I think there's still plenty there. As to sort of the balance between the script and the statement, I think the script absolutely is sort of where it's uh, where the bulk of the weight is. What I and I think it varies for, from reader to reader, but for me personally as a reader, if the script is incredible, this this statement doesn't have very much weight either way. I sort of go with. That with uh, the feeling of the script, where it has the most weight is where I'm on, when I'm on the fence. If I've read a script and I say, "There's really something here, but I'm not sure about X," right? I'm really not sure if this one element is working and what is going on there. And if I get to the statement of objectives, and this, the writer is like, "I'm really excited about this play." except I really want to focus on X. If, they want, if their questions are the same as my questions, then I'm really excited to get in a room and start working with them. Yeah. Uh, if, they, if their statement is, I think my play is perfect, uh, let's go to Broadway, <laughs> then clearly my experience of the work is different uh, than the writer's experience of their work. Um, so that's really when I'm on the fence is when it has the most weight. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, I have a two-part question. Two parts, great. Okay. <laughs> the first part is I'm kind of assuming from what you're saying you want a full-length play. Um, suppose you have a one act that you're developing sure. into a full full length. Can you submit that as well? Yes, absolutely. We um, we absolutely welcome one acts stages. I would say that I think in in my memory, and I've just finished my fifth summer at the O'Neill. Um, the shortest pieces that we've developed have hit around 70 minutes. We haven't really done anything much shorter than that. Um, but if it's something you're working on developing, right. then it's going to fall. And it's kind of processed yeah, ready exactly. to get to this point. So it's like, OK, let's take it to mm -hmm. the next level. Mm -hmm. So you would accept something. Yeah, absolutely. OK, the second part, Okay. Um, how many people go on from the O'Neill Conference who have been there in the school summer and had all the work you've put into it, we'll go beyond that? Uh, quite a number. Uh, it varies summer to summer. And as I think most of us know, some plays uh, have a very quick trajectory, and some take a really quite long time to get uh, to get out there. Um, but we it's something we work really hard at. Um, I think 2011 is our banner, our banner year. Uh, seven of the eight mm -hmm. plays that we developed during that summer uh, have had their world premiere uh, and full production. Um, and I'll also say, yeah, we because we're developmental, we don't call what we do world premiere. We don't take any subsidiary money, anything like that. Uh, it just goes out into the world. Uh, so, but but of this past summer, you know, we're still we're still working on that. The summer just ended. Uh, we know two pieces. One's going to get a workshop production, and one's going to have its world premiere. And we're still figuring out the rest. So. Um, so we have a question on Twitter uh, from Wendy Dan. Sure. She says, if you have a play with music, is it okay to apply to both programs? That is a great question and a question we get quite a lot. Um, you, ca you can't submit the same project to both conferences at the same time. Uh, what we ask is, well, first off, I'll say the Music Theater Conference, uh, we are looking for work with original music. So if you're using, uh, if you want to use old jazz standards, the music theater conference is maybe not the right fit for that. Uh, we're looking for that to be an element that's developed uh, in the same uh, in the same way that the words are. Um, 
the way to tell sort of if it should go to the music theater conference or the playwrights conference, uh, what, it, what are you hoping to focus on? Uh, it's really sort of narrowing in on your goals. Uh, if you want to focus primarily on the text, uh, then the playwrights conference may be the place for the work. Um, but the playwrights conference isn't designed to support much more. We, have, we do have a sound designer. Uh, but we don't really have very much in the way of musical support. Uh, the Music Theater Conference it is designed uh, for projects where you want to explore the text, but you also want to explore the relationship between the text and the music, uh, and the music by itself, to work with a music director um, who, sort of as I have come to understand them, sort of do dramaturgy on the music, to ask those same questions, to really pick that apart. Um, so if you're interested in the interplay between the text and the music, uh, then the Music Theater Conference is probably the better place. Um, if the focus is primarily on the text, uh, or if you're working with non-original music, uh, then the Playwrights Conference is probably the place. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, hi. Um, I'm wondering about the process. So mm -hmm. semi-finalist goes to finalist. How long does that stay, script stay blind, the reading of it? Uh, it stays blind until it hits me. So through the finalists, mm -hmm. from the semi-finalists to the, the next reading is the finalists, it's still blind. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and then at the, at the very end, uh, it's, a, it's a little less blind. We're thinking about who the community of writers is that we're bringing together. Uh, but we try to keep it as blind as possible uh, for as long as we can. And so, um, the very end, mm -hmm. you're choosing, um, I guess, I think you said something like maybe 40 plays, mm -hmm. and out of that you pick five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. who, who makes those final decisions? Uh, Wendy makes the final decisions of which ones we end up developing. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yes, sir. Yes, if I wanted to submit a play um, with multimedia components, essentially a video component and an audio component, now, this would be a straight play, no mm -hmm. musical. Um, I guess my question first is, is, can I do that? Can I submit a play that contains multimedia? And number two, um, should I, obviously, I, well, the question is, should I submit, if I have it, the audio and vi video components with the text of the play? Now, the audio and video components are actually written into the text, right. but I, I may or I may not have the audio or video components to send along with the text. Would that be advisable to do or just forget it until the play gets read and sure, somebody gonna, says yes or no? I'm going to start with the second question uh, okay. and then the first. Uh, the first question can also sort of be more broadly uh, additional materials, right? If you have these audio and video elements uh, that go with the play, or if you have had part of it read that was recorded that you want to send along, um, you can let us know that you have these materials, but we ask that you not submit them during the first round. Um, if you advance to the semi-finalist or finalist round and you want to check in again, then it might be useful for us to have. Um, but the first, the initial pool is so huge uh, that at that point we're really just focusing on the, the submitted materials. This question of plays with audio and video elements, we're seeing a lot of, I think. Um, and we've developed some. Uh, but again, we're just, we're staged readings. Uh, we're bare bones. We will not do projections for your readings. We'll have a, someone reading stage directions. Uh, who can describe all of those things. Um, and it would certainly be part of the, the stream design conversation with our design teams. How do, do the audio video elements uh, work in the story and what does that look like in an eventual production? Um, so I think all of those conversations are absolutely, I hope, going to be useful. Uh, but we, we, in the same way that we won't build a full set, we would not fully realize uh, those elements during our process. Would, would, excuse me for mm -hmm. thinking, but would, would that be a factor in your decision as to whether to accept the play or not if you felt in the final analysis the video audio components were so extensive that you couldn't 
really do justice to it. Uh, would that be a, some consideration in your, in your part? I think it goes back to what the writer would hope uh, to accomplish. Yeah. Um, if there are storytelling questions, if there are character questions, uh, where the audio vi video elements come into play, mm -hmm. um, then uh, I think it's certainly something we would consider. I, the concern would be that the sole focus of the writer's goals would be these elements that we maybe were not the right support system for. Um, but I think there is, in my, in the, my experience of the projects we've worked on with these elements, we have been able to be useful uh, to the writers. Um, and again, it varies on an individual basis. Um, but by focusing on the text, by the characters, by if we imagine the audio video elements, but we still have live bodies on stage, how do those interact? I think there's still something that can be helpful there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And you, sir. Um, what is the criterion in terms of having previously had workshop readings or things that went to the fringe or to the way on that? Great question. Uh, is a work that's had readings, workshops, productions eligible? Um, for the National Playwrights Conference, we say that it's, uh, it must remain unproduced through July 31st of 2014, so it's unproduced. You can have workshop, you can have had workshops, you can have readings. Um, we sort of say a professional production uh, is a production in which those involved were compensated for their work and all of the elements that you would hope to see were there. Um, if it's been called a world premiere, uh, if, it, if it's been critically reviewed, uh, that may be further past what we're uh, looking for. And we may say that that's ineligible. Um, but workshops and readings, uh, absolutely. It, it, uh, showcases, yep, yep. Um, it can have had those. Uh, with the Music Theater Conference, if it's had a production before, we just ask that you check in with us first. Um, that it's a that one's a little more fluid. Um, yeah. Did that help? It, it's helped, but it's still unclear. Sure. Um, so if it, uh, for example, you said if it's paid for, well, showcases are paid for. Mm -hmm. use, uh, were yeah. and the a were the actors off book would be my follow up question. If they're off book. Well, if it were something at New York Music Festival or mm -hmm. the Friends or the Royal. Sure. Yeah. Um, this, this, it is, it is, it's a tricky question, and it's a question I get a lot, and it's a question that there's not a simple answer for. Usually, when someone comes to me with that question, I ask for a lot of specifics. How many presentations were there? Were the actors off book? Were, t were people charged for tickets? All of, there are a bunch of things, um, and it's yeah, it, it varies so much uh, depending on the situation. Um, so yeah, it's tricky, and I would say if you are not sure if your work has had a professional production uh, or not, uh, please just be in touch with us, and we'll sort of talk that through on a case-by-case -case basis. Because we, if you feel uh, that there's still work remaining on your play, we want to consider it if we, if we are able to do so. We'll go to you, sir, and then back um. to the time. This is kind of a, a subjective question. Sure. But uh, how often have you produced plays that really are at the first draft stage? And by the same, on the other extreme, mm -hmm. because there's always this debate you, we have, I think, where you go like, maybe I should do a couple more drafts before I send it in, maybe next year. You know, mm -hmm. Does it ever get to the other point of where you go like, this play, whether we like it or not, is finished, is polished, is done, is ready. And it, it will not serve them to do to basically turn the O'Neill into a showcase for the play. Yeah, it, they, that that certainly happened. We've had plays uh, come through where where we felt that way. Um, and but as to how frequently uh, we have plays come to us in first draft stage, uh, there was a play we did in the summer of 2011 uh, that when it came to us, it did not have an end. Uh, <laughs> It was about two thirds of a script, and then about a half a page of. I think this is how the play ends. 
Um, but the first two thirds were really incredible. Uh, and so we started with that and um, each, so if, ah, I should have said this earlier. Uh, if you advance to the semifinals round, we'll give you a short period to provide us with an updated script uh, if you have made changes. Same thing if you advance again to, this, to the final round. Uh, so each time we hit those markers, the writer gave us a, a slightly different draft. And by the time they came to us in July, there was, I think, mostly an end. Uh, but it was really, uh, that was uh, really brand, brand spanking new. Um, first time most of that material, he'd maybe read scenes of it uh, in a writer's group, uh, but in its entirely, entirety, it was a uh, first draft. Um, but then we do, have, we do have projects that have had a workshop or two already. Um, and I think, in my impression, where we've been able to be most useful is that we have four days. So maybe they've just been around a table before. Maybe we can add in a couch and a table and put some some bodies in space, help move it a step that way. Um, so yeah, there's we try to be really flexible in our process about where the writers are at, um, and they do they do really fall pretty far along the spectrum. Yes, Is the Anil essentially people, the musical or the play, the actors, the director? Is that part of your thing, or do, do, you, or do, do people come with people? Some of both. The question was, uh, do, uh, does the O'Neill provide all of the actor, director, dramaturg yep, team, yep, yep. Uh, or do people come with people? Um, we, uh, we have a casting director. Uh, we have directors uh, that we like, but we're always open to new people as well. I would say that it's a balance. Um, mm -hmm. if there, if the writer has really strong feelings about, I wrote this character for this actor, we'll do what we can to get them up to Connecticut. Uh, or if they've already done two workshops with the same director, we're not gonna, we're not gonna mess with that if it works. Um, but also think if they don't have a director or dramaturg that they feel really strongly about, we will think, who do we know is good with new play development? who might have an affiliation with another theater company that may be able to share the script with their team. And sort of th those conversations that we have at the end of the summer about where the work might go, uh, that's something we, we keep in mind. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, from the internet. Uh, well, we have a, OK, so it's a question from Tim. And he just is curious. He says, when rejected, mm -hmm. how much comfort can we actually take with it didn't fit? If it's good, you'll make it fit, no? Sure, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, I'm trying to mentally go back uh, to the actual text of last year's rejection letter. Um, I, one of the things I really love about my work at the O'Neill is uh, that we are free sort of from stylistic or content uh, restraints in a way that other theaters may not be. Um, so it didn't fit uh, is, is uh, I hope not something uh, that we say. Um, there is a lot of good work that we turn away. Uh, and I know that. Um, it is a large process. Um, and it's a huge responsibility that I feel. And I try uh, to be as uh, humane in our rejecting process as I can be. Um, but it's, we have a pool of readers. And that's why I read all of their reports. Um, <coughs> but I trust their judgment. And if they say, this play is not ready, or this play uh, has a flaw that I don't think uh, or has a question that I don't think will be able to be answered in the time that the O'Neill has. I trust that, um, and that is uh, that's what uh, what it comes down to uh, is that uh, readership pool. Um, it's sort it's sort of tricky. I don't really know what more to say than that, um, but I hope that helps. Uh, in the back, all the way. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a hard question even for me to verbalize. Great. But it, it's in my mind. 
in terms of like a broad perspective of themes or issues or ideas, how expansive can one be and also vice versa with who's looking and reading the script? Is there a, like, it, like today, there's so many issues mm -hmm. that you can write about. In the past, what have the selections been that might have related to current events? Sure. Yeah, that's a, it's a big it's a big question. Um, I think uh, our, the National Playwright Conference artistic director Wendy Goldberg frequently says uh, that she's looking for stories that she hasn't heard before or old stories told in new ways, um, which is pretty broad, I think. Um, and I think we are free to explore a lot of issues um, in the works that we put on our stages. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't know how to get more specific yeah, than that. That's um, but I think sort of what speaks to you as a writer about today, um, if you're excited about it, we'll do our best to get excited about it as well. Yes, sir, you in the cap. Um, do you take any children's plays or family or anti children's plays? We, we, do, we have tended not to focus on works for a young audience for children. Um, uh, you're, I, you're certainly w welcome to submit it in the same pool, uh, but that has tended not to be our focus. Um, yes, sir, in the back. What some of the non traditional music theater projects that you've had might have looked like? Uh, sure. Um, the very first piece we developed with the music theater conference was an opera, uh, was uh, an opera adaptation actually of Eugene O'Neill's Desire Under the Elms. Um, more recently, uh, we've, I've been seeing a lot of more rock and pop style uh, music theater pieces um, being submitted. Uh, there, was, there has been at least one, maybe two, uh, that have been all a cappella. Um, but they're so sort of exploration of uh, instrumentation or lack thereof. Um, and the way, the way that music functions within the story. One of, our, uh, one of the pieces we developed this past summer uh, was set in a nightclub, and so much of the music uh, was generated by the nightclub band as sort of characters. Uh, does that help? It's we we try we try to be open to a lot of different uh, styles styles of music theater. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, um, getting back to rejections. Uh, <laughs> if a play, if a play <laughs> in the very early stages, uh -huh. as described by another <coughs> questioner before it was ever read aloud or anything, mm -hmm. is rejected by the O'Neill. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've revisited it years later and and rethought it, and it's radically different. Is there any point in submitting it again, or is it once turned down? Uh, no, absolutely. Um, again, this is where one of those sort of weird places where music theater and playwrights conference do it a little bit differently. Uh, playwrights conference. Uh, we simply ask that if you are resubmitting something, that you consider it to have been substantially revised. Um, take sort of that phrasing as you will, um, but we are we want you to feel like you've done a lot of work since uh, since you last submitted it, and then feel free. Uh, it'll go back in the pool, uh, back to our readership. Um, and with the Music Theater Conference, because it's, we're dealing with a smaller number of projects, we just ask that you double check in back with us. Um, and we will most likely say yes, but uh, just to tell us sort of a little bit about what that work has been. Uh, yes, you in the front. I was wondering about blind submissions mm -hmm. and, and diversity. Sure. Um, I know that blind submissions is helpful when it comes to gender. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, plays you can tell the race of a person. Mm -hmm. they're, they're Hispanic or black or whatever. So I was just wondering about: Do you have um, 
<coughs> a mandate for diversity within place election. Does that come into play at all? Or? We, we don't have any kind of mandate, um, but it is, uh, as I think I was saying about the when, when does the process become unblind, it does because become unblind uh, at a point. We are never going to have a National Playwrights Conference that is all white male writers. Absolutely not. What that, what, what it looks like instead varies year to year. Um, but yes, we will have writers of color, we will have women um, thinking about sort of, um, again, we're bringing these writers together for a whole month of residency. We're thinking about that community that we are creating. Um, so there's no, there are no quotas. We are, this summer we were not half men and half women. We were five and three. Last summer there were more women than men. Um, so it, it varies, um, but it is something that we are aware of, for sure. Uh, yes? I'd like to hire you on something. Yes. Um, if you've been in a festival and you've gotten reviewed, mm -hmm. does that? We do consider that a professional production. You do? Yep. Even though it's like a showcase and that's the way the festival considered it? Um, yeah. Usually, yes. Um, like I said, it, dep it depends on which conference you're submitting to. Um, and that's one of those cases I would ask for some more information. Okay. How many performances was it? Um, were all of the elements that you hoped would be there, were they <laughs> there? Um, there was more specifics that I would ask uh, okay. for a situation like that. And then the other follow-up question mm -hmm. I have is, do you object to like one person plays or two character plays, or do you want we take we take all kinds. Uh, we have uh, we've we've done one character plays uh, in recent years. We've done large cast plays. Um, at some point, it it gets down to the math of it all, um, and so there will usually be at least one of the one of the plays in the summer that has a smaller cast, and one of the plays of the summer that has a more expansive cast. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's there's quite a range there. Yes, from the internet. Um, Nate is curious if you could be, um, if you could go back over the, what makes um, an objective, a, strong, uh, a statement of objective, uh, a strong and a weak one, what, what are the differences between? Uh, the strong statement of objectives gives me a clear sense of who the writer is, what they're interested in, uh, what they're trying to do with the play and what they're interested in working on with the play uh, and why they want to work with me, what I might be, what I, the O'Neill, uh, might be able to bring to the table. Uh, a weak statement of objectives is an objective uh, that doesn't leave me room to engage with that. Um, if you tell me your play is perfect, I think that's really exciting, and I'm really happy for you that you've written a perfect play. Um, but I, I don't know what I, how, how I engage with you, uh, if that's where we're at. Other questions? I thought there were more hands out here. Mm -hmm. Yes. If, if you've uh, self-published your play, mm -hmm. is that does that count in the? But it hasn't production? been produced. Um, as a showcase. Okay. Um, maybe. That's a thin line. Yeah, yeah. This, and I'm sorry. I know we keep we keep going back to this. What counts as a professional production and what doesn't? And I'm sorry uh, that I don't have sort of clear guidelines. Um, but there are so many variations on readings and stage readings and workshops and workshop productions and showcases um, that it, that it's really hard to set those. Uh, so. If there's something that you're like, I want to work on and I want to work at the O'Neill on this piece, but I'm not sure if I can, just just come to us with as many specifics as you can, uh, and we'll do our best to see uh, to see how it fits. Yes, sir. Um, I've read. That, I don't know if you told me that you would uh, you invite on occasion an alum playwright to participate. And does that is that still pro still part of, of the mix? And if so, does that impact the five to the seven, or is that a separate category? Sure. So alumni playwrights, um, and also invited playwrights. So uh, um, every summer, we're going to do six to eight 
uh, plays. We shoot for eight. Um, it may be fewer than that uh, for a variety of reasons. We may be doing some construction next summer, so who knows what that'll mean. Um, and we say five to seven of those plays will come through our open submission pool. Um, the past three years, seven of eight have come from our open submission pool. We frequently, but not always, have an alumni playwright in the mix. Uh, this past summer, it was Sam Hunter. Sam went through the open submission process, so he was part of the group that is selected from that process. He got, he submitted, read blindly, the same as everyone else. It's just when we got to that very, very end selection part, um, we knew not only that we really liked the work, but we knew that he was an alumni. So that's how that weighed into it. The other piece is these invited guests. Who are they? Where do we come from? Uh, um, this past summer, it was Dave Auburn. Um, and we tried to, to invite a writer um, to the O'Neill who may be a little bit further advanced uh, in their career. But this was a brand new play. This was the first draft. He, he had actually never heard uh, this play read aloud until he got to the O'Neill. Um, and so we tried to have a mix of age and experience uh, as part of that community. Uh, so that is, that is why uh, we frequently uh, have one invited writer uh, join the community. Um, we also sometimes have writers in residence. Uh, sometimes they are invited and sometimes they come through the open submission pool. Uh, it varies. Um, but what is that different? How is that different from? They don't get uh, a rehearsal process. They are just uh, at the O'Neill uh, writing um, and engaged in conversations with Wendy, with uh, me. So they get all that feedback. They get feedback, uh, but they don't, it may be that what they're working on isn't ready. Right. Uh, to be put in a room with bodies in front of other bodies, uh, so giving them space and time and support. And that's in addition to the in addition chosen. to the selected projects. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, one page is that one single or one double spaced or how? <laughs> <laughs> any, any, any we we won't. Cut you off at one page. If you okay. if you go over, okay. you go over. Um, but uh, it, it <laughs> we we recommend that you keep it to a page. Uh, but but say what you need to say. Absolutely. I haven't seen. The, I'm sorry. Yeah. I haven't seen this application yet for this one. But the are online. there boxes that you know now? I mean the online one. There are boxes, and you think, well, now wait a minute. How can I put on? Or sure. it's it's hard to review it when it's in a box. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to, to, to um, but you get it all, whether it's overlapping the box or not. Right, yeah. So um, the we ask actually that you copy and paste the statement of objectives into a text box right. uh, in the online application. There is a character limit that I don't know off the top oh, of my okay. head. So that, that may be That's cut you off. Yeah. Um, but the, the prep list that we provide on our website does tell you that yeah. character lit that. Um, and then it's also attached to the script itself when you send us that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you select dramaturgs based on the plays that are the finalists? <clears throat> and, in other words, are you matching appropriate dramaturgs to the work? Or do you have one that you use all the time? <coughs> And then at the end of the process, what is the writer's responsibility? Uh, are they writing a report back to you, a feedback, or, uh, or some evaluation of their experience? Sure. Um, we don't select directors, dramaturgs, actors. We don't start putting any companies together until the final works are chosen. Uh, to, because those are conversations that Wendy has with the writers. Do you have directors, a director that you've been working with or someone you've always wished you could work with? Uh, same for dramaturgs. Th those, um, those happen after the work is selected. Um, we have a number of people that we've enjoyed working with. Frequently they, they will come back. Um, but none of that happens uh, until we know what we think uh, will help the writer the best, what the writer wants most. 
Uh, at the end of the writer's time with the O'Neill, uh, we hope that, I think there's like a sentence we ask that they put at the front of the script that says this play was developed at the O'Neill. Um, we may ask for a testimonial uh, for press and grants and all of that, uh, but there are no real requirements uh, for their time with us. Uh, we, we do try our best to serve them. Yes? This is going to be a really minuscule question. Right? Great. But as some of us may be working up to the very last doing a revision, mm -hmm. and we'll be doing desperately trying to proof it ourselves. Sure. <laughs> At what point do you find typos just egregious? <laughs> sure. It, de it, de it depends on the reader. Um, I, when I first started doing script reading, um, and I'm the child of English teachers, so they, they were really egregious to me. And I've come to accept that writers get really excited about the work and just sort of plow on through. Uh, so it bothers me less these days as a reader. Um, yeah. As long as I can understand, <laughs> then I think we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Any fine? Oh, yes. Uh, just, you may have said this, but I'm not sure I heard it. Did, does our initial fate rest with one reader, or, or will it get read by? It rests with one or two. And I know that's tricky. Uh, we only guarantee one. Um, my readers are so amazing that I have, they volunteer to read more scripts than we receive. So how do I determine which plays get read twice and which only get read once? It depends on the reader. It's not about me saying, oh, I want to make sure this fancy writer gets two, two script readers. Uh, it's really if, uh, if you've never read for us before and you've signed up to read, I'm going to make sure someone else is reading those scripts as well. Uh, because inevitably, someone's cat gets sick and they're not going to be able to report on their scripts on time. Uh, so I'll double up readers uh, to make sure, I'll double up old readers with new readers uh, to make sure that all of the scripts get read at least once. Um, so, so that's sort of how that math works. Yes? Do you have an evaluation system? like? based on points like how, how well the characters are developed, the structure of the script, things like that. Is sure, that great, great question. Uh, reader, when a reader uh, reports on a script for us, uh, I ask them to describe it, describe its genre or style in a couple words. Then I ask for a couple sentences about synopsis, story. Uh, then I ask for a few more sentences. Um, story, character, dialogue, uh, theme, um, sort of those, bi those big uh, dramatic elements. Uh, and then they rate it on a scale of 1 through 10. Uh, 8, 9, and 10 advance to the semifinals. 7, I'm going to look extra close at. Uh, they may advance to the semifinals, or they may be rejected with an extra sweet note at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> and 6 and below uh, are rejected. Uh, so that sort of how that works. Great. Yes, sir. Do you do an actual match of reader to a script, or is it basically they come in, you get a script, come in, you get a script? It's the, it's the latter. It's uh, totally random. We ask our readers to say, to state any conflict of interest they may have, um, writers that they feel like they would recognize their work even if the author's name wasn't attributed, or writers they've worked really closely. We're not look we because uh, so many of our readers work elsewhere in the field. Uh, we're not asking for every writer they've worked with ever. Uh, just the ones they're really close to. If you're married to a writer, we're not going to assign you their script. <laughs> and we actually have a couple of our readers who are married to writers. Um, so I, the only those uh, will pay attention to those conflicts of interest. But otherwise, uh, it's totally random. I just look at the scripts that are complete uh, and the readers that are available and assign them like that. Yep. Yes. Um, let's just say you've been a semi-finalist twice. Sure. Um, are you approving any <laughs> points? <laughs> um, you know, it'd be not, <laughs> not, not technically. Um, there's no uh, asterisk. There's, well, you will see in the application form, have you submitted before? Oh, okay. 
Um, my brain, I have a pretty good memory, so I'll start to recognize names over and over again. Um, but there's no, uh, I, I, too many, our semi-finalist pool is still pretty big. It's 250 or 300 scripts, which is still a lot. Um, and so it, it's a lot to keep track of from year to year. Um, so it may, you may start ringing bells after a couple years. Um, <laughs> But but nothing yeah. nothing technical, I'm afraid. Um, but but our database, if you say yes, I've submitted before, our database will automatically populate right. what those plays you've submitted before have been. So we do see that when we look at your record. Any other questions? Yes. I just wondered if you would share a little bit about yourself. Sure. How you found your way to the. O'Neill. Sure. How I found my way to the O'Neill. Um, I found my way to the O'Neill through the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. Um, and I have had every position in the literary office uh, that the O'Neill has. Uh, I started out there in the summers uh, and uh, as a summer intern and then summer staff and have been there full time for two and a half years and have been in this position as literary manager for uh, just about a year and a half. Uh, so I have seen five summers of the O'Neill's work um, and have been a part of and uh, have seen three full uh, selection processes um, at the O'Neill. So that's, that's I guess I was digging to find out if you were a playwright or a I'm not. Directory. I'm not. I'm not. I'm primarily a dramaturg. Um, uh, yes, sir. This is another kind of strange question. But as you were talking, I was thinking of like what something that I would submit. I think I have a script that I may have submitted, but I may have been quite a while ago. Sure. <clears throat> Honestly, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how to what degree I, I, it's been revised over the years. Right. Um, there's no way of checking that, is there? Uh, if you if you think it may have been submitted. Um, since 2000, I think our, our big computer database goes back to 2005. Okay. Uh, so it's certainly worth checking. We can look it up pretty easily. Um, OK. That would be uh, one way of checking to see what yeah. degree it's done. Yeah. Um, and this is a great time as sort of questions are winding down. And as I'm saying, check in with us. Um, please, please, please um, let us know if you have further questions, more specific questions about if you've submitted a work before, if something counts as a professional production. Um, you can find us uh, lit office at theoneal.org is the email address. Uh, we're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Um, our website has, uh, we've tried really hard to make it have a lot of really helpful information. We have a prep list so you know all of the things the application is going to ask you before you go into it. We have frequently asked questions. Um, all of that. Uh, so please, please. Uh, I would not be doing this if I didn't enjoy talking to playwrights. So uh, let us know what questions come up. Great. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We always like to see you.